Much of the intense hawkishness you see in respect to China is the result not of an overestimation of American capabilities vis-a-vis -vis China, but an underestimation of the U.S. capabilities vis-a-vis -vis China. So that's where general analyses of polarities like ours come in handy. That's what it means to say that putting something in perspective is useful. I'm Matt Gluck, Research Fellow at Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 21st, 2023. At the end of the Cold War, there was no question that the United States was the most powerful country in the world, militarily, economically, and technologically. International relations scholars call this system, where one country is more powerful than all others, a unipolar one. But most analysts now argue that America's decline over the last two decades, coupled with a simultaneous Chinese rise, has ended the United States' predominance in international politics, and that the world is no longer unipolar. Stephen Brooks and William Woolforth, international relations professors at Dartmouth College, made the argument in foreign affairs that while it's true that the United States' lead at the end of the Cold War has shrunk, the U.S. remains ahead of all other countries in terms of its military, economy, and technological production. Robert Cohane, professor emeritus of international affairs at Princeton, responded to Brooks and Woolforth's article discussing whether polarity matters for the prevention of a conflict between the U.S. and China. I sat down with Brooks, Woolforth, and Cohane for a wide-ranging conversation about what it means for a country to be the strongest of them all, the balance of power between the U.S. and China, what the war in Ukraine reveals about Russia's global standing, and much more. It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 21st, Brooks, Woolforth, and Cohane on the strength of the United States in international politics. To start, Bill, what is polarity and how is it measured? Polarity is uh, normally thought of as a distribution of resources that states can draw upon to pursue their aims in international relations, and it concentrates on the questions of how many states are distinguished by having a huge proportion of the available power resources, how many of them are there, and what are the gaps, if anything, uh, in power resources between them. And what are the key axes uh, on which polarity is measured? So, so what are the indicators that scholars who study polarity look for? They tend to focus on a few general categories, the overall economic capacity on which a government might draw to go try to do things in international politics, its military capability to deter and coerce, and its overall sort of technological capacity in order to sort of achieve any of the other objectives, it helps to have, especially in the modern era, a high level of the cutting edge or modern technology. Those are just a few of the categories. There are others one could add, but those sort of dominate the conversation. Steve and Bill, as I understand it, the primary thesis of your article is that the world is neither multipolar nor bipolar, but unipolar. In other words, no country is nearly as strong as the United States on the polarity scale. Steve, uh, many think the U.S. is no longer dominant on the world stage, and they point to a number of international developments, and that therefore the world is no longer unipolar. Why are those people wrong? Well, I guess I'd say two things. One is, you know, polarity is about, as Bill said, measuring the distribution of material resources in the world. And is that the only thing that matters in the world? Like, Definitely not. And in turn, to the extent that polarity matters, is it like determining everything? Definitely not. And I think what a lot of people notice is situations where the U.S. tries to do something in the world and it fails. So it tries to change Afghanistan into a liberal democracy. It fails. It tries to invade Iraq and pacify it. It fails. And then they're like, look, the U.S. is trying to do things. It's failing. So therefore, it must not have, you know, much power. And the response that I would have would be to say is, that's really, really, really important. Understanding how much influence the U.S. has is really, really, really important. Arguably, that's the main thing that international relations scholars try to do. However, that in some respects is the thing that we are trying to explain. And polarity is the one independent variable, one causal factor that we use to try and explain that. And it's not a good idea to kind of conflate those things. It's not a good idea to say, oh, I noticed the U.S. having more influence here 
or less influence here, and then therefore determining, oh, this means what the polarity of the system is. We can measure what the polarity of the system is, and we can ask with that polarity how much influence the U.S. has, but those are two different questions. I think the other thing that's going on is just that people are measuring, in in our view, the military capacity and economic capacity and technological capacity of states these days in basically the wrong ways. And that's because the world has changed in very fundamental ways, which requires us using kind of 21st century power measures instead of 19th or 20th century power measures. And I want to get into uh, more of those specifics in terms of measuring these different factors that uh, influence polarity later on in the conversation. But for now, I want to get some of the the primary arguments on the table. So, Bob, if I understand your piece in Foreign Affairs correctly, you agree with almost everything Steve and Bill say about the strength of the U.S. relative to other states in terms of polarity. But you think polarity is not particularly helpful as a concept. Why is that? I wouldn't quite put it that way. I would say that one way to answer your last question uh, is that Dominance and polarity are not the same thing. Dominance Im- implies much more control over the world than oh, than polarity does. So one might have said that the U.S. was more dominant in 2000 than it is now, but I agree uh, with Stephen Bill that it, we're still in a essentially unipolar world. So that, that's the that's the key distinction I'd I'd want to make. I think about this in terms of uh, concentric circles. If you have a very powerful state, uh, it can reach out farther and farther. The British reached all, all the way to Nepal when they were very powerful. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not powerful when they can't reach that far anymore. Uh, that just means that they, at that point, had an extreme level of power. Uh, so if you think about concentric circles, you think that a, a country is successful in terms of security if it can maintain control in fairly close circles. If it's very, very powerful. It may be, or thinks it is, as the U.S. thought it did, it was in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, it may reach out to places which are not part of its vital interest. And uh, what I share with realism is the conception that you have to, that one has to distinguish between what governments, powerful governments, would like to control and what their vital interests are. And do you believe that polarity matters in terms of? dictating what happens on the world stage? Or I, I would assume that you, you think it matters to an extent, but it seems that you, on the one hand, and, and Steve and Bill, on, on the other hand, disagree about the influence of polarity. So could you spell out why you disagree with them? Well, I don't, I'm not sure we disagree. I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves, and I'll say what I think about this. I think that polarity is, as Walt said, you know, one thing, one very big important thing. It's important to know. Uh, It doesn't uh, determine dominance, and it certainly doesn't dictate outcomes, especially if they're not in the in the core within the core interests of the dominant states. Uh, So, yes, the the uh, the world is unipolar now. No, that doesn't mean uh, that the United States controls outcomes, and it doesn't mean that that the U.S. is controlling outcomes as well as it was. 20 years ago, I think it's not. Now, I think that Bill and Steve may agree on that. It, they may, We may disagree on the extent to which American power defined in terms of ability to uh, influence events uh, outside our borders uh, has fallen. I don't know. Sure. Bill, would you like to respond? Yeah, we agree that both the measurable resources the U.S. can draw upon compared to its potential rivals That margin is less now than it was uh, in the late 1990s or the turn of the millennium. And so that the the background sort of capabilities the U.S. has to work with are fewer when compared to potential rivals. And we see differences in international politics as a result. If in the 1990s and early 2000s, let's say governments in Beijing and Moscow weren't very happy with their situation and sort of wish they'd like, they kind of like to push back on the United States. They kind of looked down the game tree and decided, you know, that game's just not worth the candle. The United States is just way too powerful. Situation has changed sufficiently that now they reckon they can make some attempts at changing 
uh, revising of their international position. So we see this in the South China Sea, and uh, most tragically and horribly, we see it in, in Ukraine. Those decisions were much less likely to have ever been made uh, back at the turn of the millennium than they are today. So Steve and I acknowledge there's a different material setting of international politics, and that helps to explain a reduced deference to the United States, which is another way of saying what Bob was, which is that the ability of the United States simply to make statements and issue proclamations and make its preference known and somehow have others follow suit is less today than it was back then. And people are seeing this and noticing this. And Steve and I think they are simply exaggerating its implications uh, for the United States global standing. You could acknowledge change but not jump all the way to the conclusion that the international system we're in now bears strong resemblance to the bipolarity of the Cold War or the multipolarity of, let's say, the 1920s and 1930s. Building on what Bill had to say, what I would say an important difference is that in the 1990s and early 2000s, the U.S. had such a large share of the world's power resources that it often by itself could push back on Russia or China or deter them. Essentially, close to being by itself, it had this capacity. What's different now is that, you know, Russia and China have more capabilities, so they have more capacity to engage in revisionism. And if the United States wants to deter or push back on their revisionist efforts, it really, and be effective, it really has to do so with its allies. And so what I would say is an important difference is that the polarity has, you know, changed enough that it's really the U.S. with its allies, which are kind of the thing which are the largest determining force in the international system, as compared to just the United States by itself. And that's just one reason why, you know, we actually feel like it's necessary to distinguish the kind of unipolarity that exists, and that what we call the 1990s and early 2000s, we call that total unipolarity because that was a situation where the U.S. was way far ahead in every single dimension of power. Now, it's still ahead of China in all those dimensions, but by less. And because it's only ahead by less, it therefore has a greater need to work with its allies if it actually wants to be effective. So one uh, component of global politics where polarity uh, seems to matter, and some people think it matters more, some people think it matters less, uh, is the outbreak of conflicts. So, Bob, Steve and Bill write that the multipolar nature of world politics before 1945 contributed to many large-scale wars, and that we have the end of multipolarity to thank for the absence of conflicts of that magnitude over the last 80 years or so. In your response to their article in Foreign Affairs, you argue that it's not primarily polarity that determines whether conflicts arise. So why isn't it polarity? And if not polarity, what generally leads to the onset of conflicts? The correlation is not necessarily causation. I would point as a, as a force for that contributes to conflict and war is uncertainty about the, about the responses of other powers to one's own actions and about the systemic effects of interaction. And I think uncertainty is a, in a, in a volatile situation with independent states with military forces is, is dangerous. I think it's dangerous now vis-a-vis the U.S. and China. It was manifestly dangerous in 1914 and contributed to World War I's outbreak. Uh, so I think that we should focus on polarity and uncertainty. So uncertainty is is a more fundamental cause, it seems to me, of conflict. Since, as we all know, war is a, zero, is a negative sum result. It, it has bad net results. And so it ought to be avoidable. Uh, and there ought to be some bargaining solution to it, as Fearon has pointed out, uh, that obviates it. That often doesn't happen because of the uncertainty of outcomes. That uncertainty is increased often by the multipolarity of the world. There was very little uncertainty, as either Bill or, or Steve was pointing out a minute ago, about what would happen in 1995 if if the if the Russians challenged American power. Actually, we saw it in in the former Yugoslavia uh, how little they could do. Uh, there was there's much more uncertainty now. So if, if polarity undergirds uncertainty, then why shouldn't we be looking to polarity 
as an indication of whether conflicts are likely to rise in the near future? I think that if certain forms of polarity, such as multipolarity with a number of countries that are have capabilities, at least within regions, if that is associated with uncertainty, uh, it enhances the risk of war. So, for example, the dominance of the United States in the South China area in the 1990s made it unlikely that the conflicts which did exist over Taiwan would lead to war. It was too obvious who would win. Uh, it's much more dangerous now because China is, is stronger. That's a, that's a clear example. And that's not a change in polarity. It's a change in the uncertainty of outcomes uh, if there were a military conflict. I see. So, Steve, do you share that view of polarity with respect to the outbreak of conflicts or do you have a different view? I basically completely agree. And I think what's what's happening here is that there are people in the international relations field who who use the concept of polarity in a kind of deterministic way, as if it's the only variable that matters. And so for them, they'd be like, all you need to know is, is it you know, multipolar or bipolar, and that'll tell you basically everything you need to know about the likelihood of conflict. And Bill and I just categorically reject that view. That's a very kind of hardcore, almost extreme caricature of realism, but there are people that take that approach. And I think once you step back, you know, basically you see that Bob and Bill and I are are all looking at probability or, or unipolarity as one variable among many, and we're looking at it as having probabilistic, not deterministic effects. And we tried to say that in the article, but it's not necessarily so easy, you know, to say it in print as it is to say it in writing. But basically, you know, right at the top of page 82, we said, look, basically that multipolarity led to all sorts of shifts and alliances, which were really destabilizing. And we say, these shifting, hugely consequential and decidedly uncertain alliance politics of multipolarity contributed to these conflicts in the sense of they made it more likely, didn't determine them, made it more likely. And so I think we're all in agreement that, you know, polarity is giving you an initial kind of viewpoint on what the likelihood of conflict is and that it's getting higher as you're getting a movement away from a very large concentration of power in the hands of the United States, but it's not telling you everything. Bill, you and Steve write that China's potential for revisionism is very limited to the first island chain because China lacks a command of the commons that the U.S. possesses. First off, what is command of the commons and why does the U.S. have it and China doesn't? Uh, The United States has built over, you know, generations, really, a set of extraordinarily complex systems. And by systems, I mean both material and also organizational institutional that allow it to use the global commons, by which we mean the oceans, the the skies, and deny its use by others. And those things are extraordinarily difficult to build, extraordinarily difficult to operate, extraordinarily difficult to maintain, and no other state has this capacity. And this gives the United States the material capacity to do what Bob was talking about with concentric circles, a while back. Namely, it gives it the capacity to be a major political military player in multiple regions around the globe. China is still really focused on its own region, which is really important. I'm not denying it, but has to focus on its own region, which puts it still, in a sense, militarily in a very different category uh, than the United States. The thing is here, so as we talk about sort of potential for scary, dangerous things happening, that potential is greater, it seems to us, than it was in the 1990s and early 2000s. But it's still much less than in these other polar systems. The capacity to change things in a way that would be really horrible for the United States' interests, that capacity, uh, China's capacity to do that, is lower than the capacity of some of history's well-known revisionist challengers to include the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and Imperial Japan. And, and so that's something to bear in mind. I mean, I guess I'd say like, you may be wondering, well, what good is polarity if it can't give you deterministic answers to questions like the causes of war? Uh, it, it's a lens to help you see and put in perspective the level of challenges that we face. And I guess, you know, I could talk about the Cold War challenges by appealing to age and saying, I remember the Cold War. I remember crawling under my desk or going down to the fallout shelter. 
Uh, but it, it, I don't think people should have to rely on age to make assertions of uh, comparative levels of challenge or threat. And polarity, for all its flaws, really helps us to do that. And that's one of the points we emphasized in that piece. It's really important. I mean, we we all have a tendency as analysts to kind of give a lot of attention to the world that we see today. It's right in front of us. But we have to put these things in historical perspective. And the point is, is that Russia and China now have a greater ability to engage in revisionist behavior than they did before. But before it was essentially zero. Now they have a little bit of revisionist capacity, but it's very geographically constrained. I mean, it's quite remarkable if you think about it, that Russia is struggling to conquer more than 20% of the state next door to it. You know, And the reason it's struggling in significant part is not just because Ukraine's capacity and effectiveness but also because it's being aided by the state, the United States, which still has the most material power alongside with the United States allies, which also have a lot of material power. So Russia can do more than it could do before, but very little in the larger scheme of things when you compare it to past revisionists, including to the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was able to conquer 300 million people in Eastern Europe. Russia is struggling to conquer 20% of Ukraine. That's different. And I want to get to the war in Ukraine uh, in a few minutes. But Steve, what can the difference in military power that you identify between the U.S. and China tell us about the likelihood of either a conflict in Taiwan or a larger scale conflict between the U.S. and China? The bottom line is, as the polarity shifts further and further you know, away from kind of what we call total union polarity, the more fine grained you have to look to actually get an answer of what's going on. So, so let me add a more political dimension to this military analysis. If you look at what the response was to China's greater assertion in the South China Sea after 2012, um, what you see is exactly what balance of power theory would have predicted. It, it's a perfect illustration. That is, you see the potential of the states in the region who have felt potentially threatened by China from Japan, Korea, uh, to New Zealand, Australia, and Vietnam, which is a striking one, rallying around the United States, agreeing to partner in more intense ways with the United States, effectively allying with the United States, whether formally or not. This is a very striking confirmation of balance of power theory. That's exactly what Ken Waltz would have predicted. Uh, and so we should look at this in a, in a broader theoretical sense also. And the Chinese made a huge strategic mistake because they didn't understand that, or at least weren't willing to act on an understanding of what they, what predictably their assertion would generate, given the context and given the number of countries that were potentially American allies in the area. And Bob, do you think that China has continued down that path, or has it recognized that, that it went in the wrong direction at that point and started to reverse course? Well, I'm not a China expert, and I don't. I don't have a secret microphone in the, China, in the Chinese uh, uh, governing councils. They seem to have pulled back in the last uh, six to nine months from their very assertive uh, policies. And whether that is simply tactical, or uh, whether it reflects economic weakness, or whether there is a re- strategic rethinking going on in Beijing, I have no idea. On this issue, I think you know, in terms of you know. I think Bob is exactly correct that, you know, Chinese leadership made a huge strategic mistake in basically being assertive too early. I mean, Deng Xiaoping's uh, policy of gradual peaceful rise was a brilliant, you know, grand strategy. And his point would be is, you know, China can think about how assertive it's going to be when it actually becomes something like a peer of the United States. And I think that this entire discussion that we're having is kind of like, what is the distribution of power actually really matters in the sense of my sense is that China thought that the system was actually getting pretty darn close to bipolarity. And they thought, well, we've waited a long time. Now let's actually engage in some revisionist actions. And basically, you know, what they're finding, you know, is when they start pushing back, other states are in the region, as Bob said, you know, looking at this and they're saying, you know what, if I was to pick a country that I want to be military allied with, 
it would be the United States. And the reason why is it's just a way more powerful and at least B, notwithstanding some problems like the war with Iraq, the U.S. historically has been a quite trustful ally that states aren't afraid of, whereas China doesn't have that kind of track record. So, Steve, just just following up on that point quickly. So as I understand what you're saying, and this is really interesting, might it be that people are misreading China's aggressiveness as an indication of its material power, but it might just be the aggressiveness in itself and uh, the material power might be lacking? Yeah, I would definitely separate those. And that going back to something that Bill said before, I mean, basically in the 90s and early 2000s when we had total unipolarity, you know, China thought there's no revisionism that I can do. It's just, it's not worth it. Now what they basically, I think, are learning is I can do a little bit of revisionism provided that it's not very consequential and provided that it doesn't cause the U.S. and its allies to kind of act together in a way which is constraining China. And the trick is it learn that that window between like what a little bit of revisionism is that doesn't cause the U.S. and its allies to do much versus what's too much is actually pretty narrow in that basically there are some basic things that China can do in the South China Sea without provoking a response from the U.S. and its allies. But it goes any point past that and the, and it's going to get a pushback of the kind that, that Bob talked about. So that's another way in the context of Asia for saying you know, China's window for revisionism is very small, certainly in comparison to the to the past revisionists that were been seen throughout history. I would just add one one thing: any potentially aggressive or a state that wants to expand its its power needs to have a working theory of the domestic politics of its victims. The Nazis had essentially, uh, I think, a correct theory that their potential victims in East Europe were divided and weak. And if they could separate them from their allies, they could uh, intimidate them. Uh, the Chinese uh, were working, seemed to be working maybe on the same theory. It was wrong. So they both, they both faced a stronger ally that was willing to step up uh, to support its potential, it, its, its regional partners, and stronger domestic polities that were not as willing to cave in. And, of course, Taiwan is, is a great example because the Chinese really would like to work with the more pro, uh, pro-Chinese faction in Taiwan, but they, the result of their pressure is to strengthen the anti-Chinese faction, which should, which should be predictable, but the Chinese have failed to anticipate that. I want to shift to the war in Ukraine. Bill and Steve, while most point to this war as evidence of the U.S.'s declining power, you say that if anything, it actually suggests the opposite, at least with respect to the relative power balance uh, between the U.S. and Russia. Bill, why is that? Well, what's happening now is a classic example of shifting goalposts. I mean, to look at this war and think it somehow indicates that something about U.S. decline is extraordinary. What it indicates is something about Russian decline. If you had asked uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, or told Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia back in the 1990s, uh, that 20 years hence, Russia would be fighting for its life, try to hold on to a bit of Ukraine, he would have been astonished and appalled that such a future was even possible. The Russian political elite has defined its core interest as embracing Ukraine and denying the West Ukraine ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, Russia exhausted every possible tool of statecraft that it's disposed to try to achieve that a political objective and finally opted for the one that it thought it had, that it thought uh, would deliver it its political object, namely main military force. And it has failed manifestly in that, even if the war stalemates as people now expect uh, or see as, as likely in the near future, even if the war stalemates. Uh, that outcome is a disastrous defeat for Russia's claim to be a great power for its entire political object since the end of the Cold War. Yet, because of the kind of biases in assessing power that Steve and I discuss, remarkably and astonishingly, you're seeing people run around suggesting this is somehow a sign of some massive strategic failure by the United States, this huge defeat. If not, if every inch of Ukrainian territory is not recovered by Kiev, somehow that means America is a paper tiger. It's exactly that kind of crazy bias in the assessment of American power, which we're trying to combat in that article. 
And it's that exactly that kind of wild uh, and unfortunate shifting of goalposts, which we think leads to potentially bad policy prescriptions. Indeed, much of the intense hawkishness you see in respect to China is the result not of an overestimation of American capabilities vis-a-vis China, but an underestimation of U.S. capabilities vis-a-vis China. So that's where general analyses of polarities like ours come in handy. That's what it means to say that putting something in perspective is useful. If you don't keep your eye on these kinds of things, I think you can see a situation in which something like the outcome of the war in Ukraine will be interpreted completely in a completely biased way. Bob, how, how, what do you see the uh, the war in Ukraine revealing about the sustenance of uh, the U.S.-led liberal order? Well, what I think it illustrates is uh, a point I made in my response, and that is the importance of domestic politics, which we haven't talked about. Because the weak point in the U.S. response is domestic, is the, surprisingly to me, large number of people in the United States uh, on the right and also on the left who are not committed to supporting Ukraine uh, in a traditional NATO-supported deterrence defense way. Uh, and that that is the is the weak point in the U.S. Uh, armor. Not I, I agree. It's not Russia has shown itself to be weak and and not strong, and is following a last resort strategy. Uh, the U.S. It's kind of an obvious strategy. It seems to me for the U.S. to push back because it's going to be a winning strategy. And yet you see a substantial part of the Republican Party and some of the left wing Democrats not wanting to do it. So to me, uh, it just illustrates that. We should talk and think a little bit more about domestic politics when we think about world politics, because if we simply stylize countries as as always behaving in their rational interest, uh, we miss some of this discrepancy. Steve, how do you think about domestic politics vis-a-vis polarity? Obviously, uh, you and Bill say that polarity is not determinative, um, and there are many other characteristics of the international system that, that play very important roles. But how do you see the relationship between polarity and domestic politics? Yeah, I mean, it's a really important issue. And, you know, the point of the matter about polarity is that, again, in the eye of some, you know, theorists, what they would say is, I'm going to look at polarity. And that means, you know, I can ignore domestic politics, like never look at it. And the approach that Bill and I have is different, which is kind of, you know, let's look at what polarity is, and that's important, and then, you know, see how far you can get with it, see what insights you can get with it on its own. But of course, for a lot of things, it's not going to be enough, in which case you are going to have to look, you know, at domestic politics. But I want to go back to something that, that Bill was emphasizing, which is that, and it relates to what Bob's point was as well, which is in this case, I think there's actually an interaction effect between how people think about the polarity of the system and what's going on domestically. And that I agree with Bill that, you know, right now, if you listen to the people who want to stop supporting Ukraine, 90% of those people are on the Republican side, on the conservative side. And their main argument is the U.S. isn't powerful enough to basically be deterring Russia and China at the same time. It has to focus all of its attention on China because it's declined so much and or because China has risen so much. And what our article basically says is that's completely wrong. I mean, they're just thinking about the U.S. position, the system wrong. The U.S. still does have enough power to be in a position to deter Russia and China at the same time. And I think if we could kind of clear out that argument then I think a lot of what's going on in the domestic political side of things, which Bob is correct, is really important. I think a lot of that would kind of go away. So in other words, I think that people are misjudging the polarity of the system and it's fueling this kind of domestic backlash to say that we can't support Ukraine. And that's because these people are arguing we're just not powerful enough. But that's just not true. Steve, could you describe some of the metrics that people are using to analyze polarity uh, that you think are wrong or some of the measurements that don't tell the full story? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you look at kind of the person who is, you know, 
done the most in terms of arguing that the U.S. is not powerful enough to be acting in Ukraine uh, anymore. It has to leave Ukraine and go to only uh, focusing on Asia, be Elbridge Colby. And if you ask, well, why is that? And he'll say, well, it's because the U.S. isn't powerful enough. And you're like, well, how do you know that? He'll be like, well, look at the fact that, you know, China has way more patents than the United States does now. And so that just shows that it's way more technologically capable than the United States. And it's true. China has more patents than the United States does. But the answer question is, why? And the answer is, China pays its researchers for patents. It didn't used to, but then it started to. And when it said, I'll pay you for patents, patents not surprisingly exploded. Moreover, not surprisingly, the quality of the patents you know, went through the floor. So China has a lot more patents than the United States, but most of them are basically garbage. And so therefore, you can't use that metric. You have to use metrics that China cannot manipulate. China is manipulating huge number of statistics, including GDP, in order to make itself look better. And that's both for domestic reasons and international reasons. And the trick is for analysts in the U.S., they have to recognize that China is manipulating these statistics instead of just taking them at face value. And way too many people on the right, basically right now, have reasons, incentives, it seems, to basically be listening to what China has to say about it being 12 feet tall and basically agreeing without actually being critical and actually looking at whether those measures like patents actually are valuable. Thank you. That's clarifying. I want to turn to global alliances now more squarely. So Bob, building on your earlier work, Steve and Bill write in their America Abroad book that hegemonic leadership plays a critical role in not only the establishment, but also the maintenance of the globalized economy and the world order that currently predominates and has for decades. Do you view hegemonic leadership as important for the maintenance of the liberal world order? And if so, why isn't polarity important in that context? Well, the answer to the first one is yes, of course, I wrote a book about that. And uh, the two the two aspects are both important. It's not hegemony by itself. It's hegemonic leadership. That is, it's hegemony coupled with a policy of what, what Bill and Steve call deep engagement or whatever you want to call it, but a policy that doesn't attempt to do everything, but that does engage with maintaining a world order which is conducive to the survival and prosperity of the United States and therefore conducive to the survival and prosperity of countries that are allied with us or similar to us in in values and structure. Uh, so I think that's that is certainly true. Now once again once again back to, back, back to polarity, uh, I, I'll just re- repeat what I said. Polarity is not uh, it doesn't it doesn't give us an answer. It simply says, well if if the world is unipolar as the three of us agree, uh, then it's a lot easier to maintain that order. Uh, then if it's not, it's, it's much easier to have, well, it's, it's maybe a condition for hegemonic leadership that the world be unipolar, but it's, but it's not, uh, sufficient. So that you can imagine the U.S. being unipolar and deciding, uh, or the world being unipolar and the U.S. deciding to disengage, uh, anyway. I agree with Bill and, and, and Steve, it wouldn't make a lot of sense, but you could imagine that situation. So it's not simply the polarity, it's the polarity plus, plus the policy. So just so the, the reason I asked the question is because, and please correct me if I'm wrong, at one point, I, I understand uh, one of your statements in the past about the, or you, you're writing about the sustainability of the liberal world order in a post-hegemonic world. And so that that argument seem to imply to me that while hegemony is essential to the establishment of that world order, it's not necessarily as essential to the maintenance of the world order. And so that, that's why I was trying to, to clarify whether there's a line between the establishment of a liberal wor- world order and the maintenance in terms of hegemony. Is there, is there not a, a large difference there? Well, uh, world politics and, and its analysis is always contextual. Uh, if if we had to have a situation where there are no powerful, even if they're not as powerful as the United States, powerful and revisionist states, uh, then a, a a liberal world after hegemony, I argued, was 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 feasible. Uh, I think 
I should have, I, if I were to rewrite that now, I would say there's a scope condition on that, on that assertion. The scope condition is that there not be uh, powerful states, even if not as powerful as a leading state, which are devoted to overturning the system and which have fundamentally different values. If there are such states, I think that uh, liberal and maintenance of a liberal world order uh, without hegemony would be very difficult. Bill, how do you see polarity as influencing the future of this liberal world order in the, the coming decades? In other words, what do you think your argument reveals about the sustainability of the liberal world order? I think a lot hinges on how precisely one defines that order. And I think Steve and I uh, have a com- somewhat more limited version of it, certainly than its critics who attribute to the world order sort of, you know, very grandiose objectives. Uh, we see it as a more limited but very important set of institutions, rules, practices that are undergirded by these alliances the United States has. And what our analysis suggests is that um, the United States retains this capacity. So you have this potential for leadership that Bob refers to and that it would be in the, and what our work uh, demonstrates uh, is that it would be in the interest of the United States and its allies for this to continue and that it's possible for it to continue, but it's harder than it was in the 1990s and early 2000s, as we keep saying, which means the United States now has to keep its eye on the ball and concentrate on those essential underpinnings of the order which for us are really crucially the European and Asian alliances, uh, as opposed to undertaking further projects and certainly undertaking the idea of sort of expanding this order to new regions or new areas or uh, new aspirants. Uh, So a kind of, I know it's going to sound funny to an American uh, audience, but a conservative vision of the liberal order coupled with the increment of power that we established the United States does have, I think leads to a fairly robust prospect. And if I can add one other thing uh, in this conversation as we think about uh, this world order, is that the world order is the status quo. It is what is. And it's hard to overturn status quo. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that, from scholarship and strategic thinking going all the way back to Clausewitz. And what we have today is a status quo that's hard to overturn. It's backed up by an overwhelming preponderance of power, if you include the liberal allies of the United States. And the me- the primary mechanisms for rapid change, namely great power war, are largely off the table. At least we hope they're off the table because of nuclear deterrence. And the other sort of catalyst of rapid change would be the collapse, the utter collapse of one of the protagonists, like happened to the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War. If you don't have a great power war and you don't have a total collapse and you have a well-settled status quo, Well, the job for revisionists is really, really, really hard. And the job for those who want to defend this liberal order is relatively smoother. So one implication of this conversation is not to exaggerate the challenges of a relatively constrained vision of this order going forward. Steve, you and Bill write in your piece, and I'm quoting, today, almost all the world's real alliances bind smaller states to Washington, and the main dynamic is the expansion of that alliance system. Many wouldn't agree with that statement in light of the emerging partnership between Russia and China, the BRICS group, uh, and other alliances. Could you explain why the alliances that don't involve the U.S. are relatively insignificant compared to those that do? The potential uh, alternative alliances like that between Russia and China are not nearly as meaningful as the alliances the United States has with its allies because the Russia-China partnership is essentially a marriage of convenience. So far, we've seen almost no willingness on the part of China to do anything costly to help Russia. China will help Russia when it's in its interest to do so. China will buy cheap Russian oil. But anytime there's a costly action that Russia would have to take or China would have to take to help the other, we don't really see this. And if you want an extreme example, it would be the fact that China is not willing to provide military assistance to Russia at this point. And then you'd have to ask yourself, well, why is that? And in our view, it's largely because the United States and its allies have made it clear that if China were to provide this military assistance, then 
there will be grave consequences. So there's still enough power in the hands of the United States and its allies, and they can still work together in an effective way such that they can actually prevent China from, in many ways, assisting its ally. Larger point is, I think, when you're looking at these other groupings, you just have to make a comparison between what they say and what they do. In many cases, they say some pretty grand things. But then in terms of actually what they do later on, it's actually not that meaningful. So it's true that the BRICS countries would probably like for the dollar to no longer be the reserve currency. However, their likelihood of actually cooperating on that goal is low. And even if they did cooperate on their goal, their likelihood of actually being successful in that goal in the short to medium term is also low. So the point of the matter is I think that it's interesting that when we're thinking about the power of BRICS countries or Russia and China, everyone looks at what they say and says, oh, well, obviously they're going to be able to do that. And obviously that's going to change the world. Well, we know from the experience of the United States when it was incredibly powerful in the 1990s and early 2000s that it may want to change the world in certain ways, but the world may not cooperate. You know, it's hard to make dramatic changes in the world. And what the U.S. hopefully will do in the future is focus on protecting the status quo. And if you look at our foreign policy from that standpoint, then I think actually the U.S. has been quite successful and will continue to be quite successful. Uh, But there is a a shift taking place and it's not uh, manifest yet in policy, but it's it's indicative of what the BRICS are not willing to do. They're not willing to support the U.S. in the U.N., on Ukraine, even though it seems like a straightforward case, case of aggression. So, and the U.S. was apparently rather surprised by the lack of support it received in Africa and Asia on in U.N. boats uh, on a very clear case of uh, of an uh, armed attack across borders, not not ambiguous. Uh, so that's a that's a shift, and it's a it's a shift not toward what the BRICS can do. But what they're not willing to do and not willing to support, and I think it's it's an indicator that the U.S. should should look at as a long as a long term difficulty, uh, because these countries will become are becoming stronger economically. They're growing faster than the rich countries, and therefore they will have more more ability to take actions independently in twenty years than they have now. And the approaches, the approach they take, the alignments they have, the orientations their elites have will be important. So if if I were thinking about long term U.S. foreign policy, there ought to be more thinking about that, even though you're right, it's not going to affect us very strongly right now or the next five or 10 years. Yeah. Bob's point about the time horizon is like so crucial in the sense of, you know, a lot of what is happening now in the United States is that, and this is true on both the Republican and Democratic sides, is a temptation to say, well, if we set it up this way, then the U.S. can get a little bit better of a deal or a little bit better of gains in the short term. And the trick is, in the long term, the thing that works the best for the United States is basically having the kind of liberal, open global economy that it tried to foster after World War II. Year after year, that's what's going to give you the most gains. But in a short-term period, there can be situations where uh, leaders are going to be tempted to go after uh, very restricted gains. But the problem is if they do that, in the long term, it could actually degrade the system and therefore degrade this kind of long-term benefit that the U.S. has gotten in the past. Bob, you mentioned that that these countries, uh, BRICS among others, didn't express support for the U.S.'s efforts in Ukraine, but that right now those partnerships have resulted more in anti-U.S. Uh, sentiment than in kind of a in, in legitimate international initiatives that that reflect real power in those in those institutions. So, what should we be looking for in the next? decade or so that would suggest more of these material partnerships that could really shift the the world order in significant ways? Well, I wouldn't have said anti-U.S. I would I would have said that these are these are very self-interested countries that are looking to both develop economically and to 
develop and, and maintain independent foreign policies w where they can determine their own policy. And they're doing just what you'd expect countries to do. Uh, so I, I think that we're going to see uh, a situation where if for the U.S., if the U.S. asks itself, what policies can we follow which are mutually supportive of these countries' interests and ours, uh, we can get lots of success because they have lots of reason to want to partner with the United States. And as either Steve or, um, or, or Bill said earlier, the U.S. has a, not a perfect, but a pretty good record, so-so record at least, of not uh, interfering and, and taking advantage of partnerships to dominate. So that, so that's, that's, that's worth doing. But it's not a matter of getting them on our side or of them being anti-U.S. It's a matter of asking, how can we align our interests with theirs in such a way that you can have an enduring partnership, which is happening in, in thanks to the Chinese in Southeast Asia and happened in Western Europe, thanks to Russia after, after World War II. Bob, Steve, Bill, we'll have to leave it there. I have learned a great deal from this work and your other work. So I thank you for that and for this excellent conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It was lots of fun. Yeah, appreciate it. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.